first item of business is general questions. Uh, short and succinct questions and answers would be useful. Question number one, Ash Denham. Thank you, President. Ask the Scottish Government, in light of the ongoing review of the Children's Scotland Act 1995, what consideration it is giving to putting a professional system, such as the Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service in England, in place for family courts in Scotland? Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Government plans to launch a consultation shortly on the review of Part 1 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. The consultation will cover a wide range of issues in relation to parental responsibilities and rights, child contact and residence, alongside a wider family justice modernisation strategy. Ash Denham. The proposal that private practice solicitors who currently act as child welfare reporters will receive two days training will not be, I feel, putting children's welfare at the centre. Elsewhere, it's deemed that people who are qualified and skilled caring professionals are best placed to assess our children and families' needs. Could the Minister provide assurances that this will be considered within the review? Annabel Ewing. Yes, I, I can, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, the consultation that I referred to a moment ago will indeed seek views on whether to regulate uh, child welfare reporters. Uh, and, of course, being a child welfare reporter is an important uh, uh, and difficult and challenging job. But I do believe that, uh, in particularly taking uh, that into account, that regulation is indeed required to ensure that reporters are fully trained in the tasks that they are asked to carry out and to ensure that the quality of reports is uh, consistently high across the board. Supplementary, Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. If I might um, ask the Cabinet Secretary... Has a decision been taken on the form of training that may be provided to child welfare reporters within the review, specifically training relating to parental alienation as part of that, as is happening south of the border? Annabel Ewing. Uh, what I can say to the member is that the consultation, which is to be launched shortly, uh, will seek uh, the views uh, about uh, whether to uh, regulate child welfare reporters, including therefore uh, ongoing training requirements uh, and will encourage uh, those who submit to the consultation I would encourage all those with an interest to do so uh, to uh, elicit their views on what kind of training they felt would be most appropriate. Question number two, Jamie Halcrow-Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the effectiveness of the Flexible Workforce Development Fund. Jamie Hepburn. It, while the Flexible Workforce Development Fund pilot is still in its first year of operation, the Scottish Government has commissioned an independent evaluation of the pilot thus far. The evaluation commenced in February 2018 and is due to conclude shortly. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, in this first year, provision for the Fund has centred on colleges. Would the Minister be prepared to indicate whether he would consider opening up the Fund or any successor programme to other suitable providers of training and skills in future years? Jamie Hepburn. It, well, this is uh, an issue that has been raised with me uh, by a, a number uh, of organisations, uh, President Officer, and uh, what I've said to them is what I'll say to, to Mr Halker Johnson. We have uh, the pilot in place. We're essentially still at the pilot stage, so uh, this coming year it will be my intention that it continues to be delivered through the college sector. But we have the evaluation, we'll continue to learn, uh, and uh, no assumptions about what might happen going forward uh, have they yet been made. Question number three, Bob Doris. Scottish Government House Centres that provide a supervised contact facility for absent parents to spend time with their children are inspected and regulated. Annabel Ewing. The contact centres managed by Relationship Scotland all follow national standards and practice procedures. Relationship Scotland has policies which cover issues such as domestic abuse, child protection, equality and diversity, confidentiality and vulnerable adults. There are also a number of independent contact centres. Some of these have their own guidance and practice and procedure. As I said in response to question one, presiding officer, the Scottish Government plans to launch a consultation shortly on the review of part one of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. And this will, amongst other topics, seek views on whether to regulate contact centres. Bob Doris. Um, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, Minister, when constituents of mine had issues with a particular contact centre not affiliated to Relationship Scotland, they discovered there appeared to be no regulatory body no agreed quality standards or inspection process in place for contact centres. That is despite the significant bearing they can have on family relationships long term and the need reports to courts in child custody cases. Will the Minister look at regulation in this area and will she meet with me to discuss the matter further? 
Annabel Ewing. I, I can say to the member that uh, uh, in the forthcoming consultation, uh, uh, views will be sought on regulation of contact centres, including, therefore, the setting of minimum standards on the accommodation that is used, uh, laying down uh, training requirements, uh, laying down complaints procedure uh, uh, and in, in inspection uh, processes. So I hope that, that that provides some assurance to the member in terms of the direction of travel. And of course, once the consultation is launched, which is to be very soon indeed, presiding officer, I would be very happy to meet with uh, the member to discuss matters further. Supplementary, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. In light of the fundamentally new approach proposed in the recent legal aid review, Will the Minister consider putting child contact centres on a statutory funding footing through legal aid rather than relying on voluntary effort to provide this important service? Annabel Huey. Uh, as I've already stated, the consultation will look at the, uh, the regulation of uh, con child contact centres and I would imagine we would receive a number of views on, on issues uh, 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 about uh, them, including on funding. I would point out to the member that as far as legal aid is concerned, I can advise that in 2016-17, the Scottish Legal Aid Board sanctioned £459,583 of legal aid funding with regard to contact centre cases, albeit that it should be pointed out that the actual uh, uh, sum ultimately claimed or paid may differ from the amount uh, sanctioned. At the same time, of course, it should be pointed out that not all uh, uh, users of child contact centres are eligible for legal aid. But the consultation, to be launched very shortly indeed, uh, will seek views on all of these issues, and I would encourage uh, the member to make his views known. Question number four, Donald Cameron. Um, <coughs> thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve ferry services in the Highlands and Islands. Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government has invested over one billion over the past decade in new vessels, new routes, improved harbour infrastructure and cheaper fares. And that clearly demonstrates our commitment to the long-term prosperity of our island communities to further strengthen our fleet. Uh, as the member will know, we've invested in two new 100-metre dual ferries worth £97 million currently in construction at Ferguson's. Uh, we've also recently provided uh, the money to CMAL to allow them to purchase the three passenger vessels which serve the Northern Isles, guaranteeing lifetime, lifeline connections to and from Orkney and Shetland. We're also committed to rolling out RET uh, to the Northern Isles, which has already been a major success on the West Coast. Donald Cameron. I thank the Minister for his, his answer and he referenced the two new ferries. Um, can he confirm when those two new ferries on order with Ferguson Marine will be ready for service? Hamza Youssef. Well, the timetables that we've previously publicly uh, committed to are still the timetables that we have uh, from Ferguson's. Obviously, we're keeping a close eye on that. We work very closely and CMA work very closely uh, with Ferguson's. What I would say to the members, it's worth saying that these are the first ever LNG dual fuel uh, vessels built in the UK. So therefore there are naturally complexities with the new workforce. And if there are developments uh, on the timetable of the Glen Sanex and 802, I'll make sure Parliament is updated appropriately. Supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Uh, just following on from the undertakings given around the time of the budget earlier this year, I wonder if the Transport Minister could update Parliament on uh, the discussions with Orkney Islands Council about improvements to the internal services in Orkney. Hamza, you said. The Scottish Government was delighted, of course, in our budget discussions to, uh, to, to give a payment, a one off payment in the budget uh, to Orkney and uh, Shetland, which I know is supported by both uh, Liam MacArthur and Tavish. Uh, Scott begrudgingly perhaps but nonetheless uh, supported uh, nonetheless and uh, what we did say is the second part of that commitment of course which was important was that we would uh, through the working group ensure that we have a long-term solution in my recent visit to both Orkney and Shetland both leaders of the council raised this with me as did uh, previously both uh, Liam MacArthur and Tavish Scott and I've agreed this summer to travel back to Orkney and Shetland and convene that uh, that working group and of course I will keep both members and indeed parliament updated on how those discussions go. Supplementary, John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. The Minister recently agreed to consider my proposal to involve the, the trade unions and CalMAC with CMAL in the procurement process. I wonder if he can advise the, the Chamber whether he's agreed to that request and what discussions, if any, he's had with the trade unions. Hamza Yousaf. So on my visit just a couple of weeks ago to Orkney and Shetland, in Orkney, uh, I met with uh, the RMT uh, and indeed uh, Unite the Union as well, so I met with the trade unions. Uh, and we referenced uh, the question uh, uh, that I answered from John Finney. So discussions are ongoing. I am open-minded to the idea. I think it makes perfect sense for future procurements. Of course, uh, the next contract that we're looking towards is the Northern Islands contract, 
uh, or the large, large contract would be the Northern Isles contract, uh, and uh, discussions with trade unions uh, will be very much part of that discussion. Question number five, Daniel Johnson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on delivering the Policing 2026 strategy. Michael Matheson. Last week, the Scottish Police Authority Board approved an updated Policing 2026 implementation plan covering the period to 2020. The plan sets out a number of early achievements, including improvements in custody provision, rollout of the services wellbeing programme, and the testing of new local policing models. The Scottish Police Authority Chair has also outlined her intention to establish a designated committee to oversee transformation. The Scottish Government continues to support Policing 2026, delivering real terms protection of the police resource budget and a further £31 million of reform funding this year. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Indeed, uh, last week's SPA board meeting uh, discussed the budget uh, for the next three years including Police Scotland's plans for much needed and welcome reforms, including reductions in backfilling and investment in information technology. So can I ask, first of all, is the government fully committed to meeting the costs of these reforms, including the indicated £206 million of capital spend on information technology over the next five years? And second, given that the BTP inter integration is due to come out of the police reform budget and is explicitly not accounted for in the SPA plans, is the minister at all worried that the as yet unknown costs of BTP integration could harm these wider and much needed plans for reform in the police? Michael Matthews. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, and the work which has been taken forward by Police Scotland in relation to its ICT development is part of the work that was recommended by Audit Scotland in making sure they had a robust um, ICT strategy in place. And I welcome the work that they're taking forward in developing that plan. And of course, the uh, funding which will be required for this is a matter which the SPA will have to give consideration to. And any business plan for taking forward the request for funding like that will obviously be given due consideration. What the member will also be aware is that at the present moment, Police Scotland have confirmed to the SPA their intention to invest almost £5 million in core operational policing systems this year in order to make sure that it delivers benefits to officers uh, carrying out frontline duties in communities. There's a lot of um, private chats going on. It's making it difficult for uh, questioners and ministers to be heard. Quick supplementary, please, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe progress is being made in the management and leadership of Police Scotland? Michael Matheson. Uh, President Officer, I believe there is. Um, uh, DCC uh, Livingston is an experienced and well-respected uh, police officer who is uh, offering uh, excellent leadership to the organisation going forward, supported alongside uh, two Deputy Chief Constables and uh, nine Assistant Chief Constables. The Scottish Police Authority have also set out uh, their plans for the recruitment of further DCCs and also ACCs, and that programme has already been taken forward and that they intend to have a recruitment process which will see the new Chief, Chief Constable being in post by the end of this year. Question number six, Liam MacArthur. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on there being a distinct rural dimension to uh, fuel poverty and whether it plans to take forward all of the recommendations of the Scottish uh, Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, this Government has always prioritised tackling fuel poverty and is committed to ensuring that everyone in Scotland lives in a warm home that is affordable to heat no matter where they live. We recognise that fuel poverty... Excuse me, Minister. Um, you, oh, you were turned off at source, but you're back on again. <laughs> I don't know why that Thank was. You, I'm officer. not responsible. It's the first time I've been turned off at source. Um, we recognise that fuel poverty in our remote, remote rural and island communities requires particular attention, and that is why we established the Scottish Rural, rural Fuel Poverty Task Force who reported their findings in October 2016, and we published our response to this in March 2017. I hope you caught all that, Mr MacArthur, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Uh, this uh, exchange has taken an uncomfortable uh, turn. Uh, could I perhaps just ask the Minister, though, to reflect on the unwillingness so far for the Scottish Government to accept the advice of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, its own fuel poverty definition group, 
all of the local authorities and housing associations in the Highlands and Islands, CAS, Shelter and a range of other organisations that you need to have a minimum income standard for remote and rural areas if you're to be able to tackle fuel poverty uh, at source in the communities like Orkney uh, that are most heavily affected by fuel poverty. Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank uh, Mr McArthur for his question. Um, Presiding officer, is, he well knows that he takes a great interest in all of this. Um, our delivery plans are focused on remote and rural uh, and island areas. Uh, the per head spend uh, on heap sabs in uh, remote, rural and island areas is £9,000 compared to £7,500 elsewhere. Uh, and while the majority of the recommendations that were made by the task force were for the Scottish Government, there's also a significant number for other bodies to look at too, including the UK Government, Ofgem and energy suppliers. We will continue to listen to remote, and, uh, remote rural and island communities uh, and both the bill and the strategy which we'll publish uh, before uh, the end of this term will be designed to ensure that they are focused on those who are, are most in need to help heat their homes no matter where they live in Scotland. Quick supplementary please, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Deputy President Office. Uh, rural properties are very rarely connected to the gas ne network and often rely on kerosene central heating. What plans do the Scottish Government have to ensure that rural areas can play their part in decarbonisation? And do they have plans to introduce schemes to help rural residents upgrade and modernise heating systems and boilers? Quick response, please, uh, Kevin I thank uh, Mr Chapman for his question, and we'll continue to review all of these things. I'm very aware of the fact that um, those households that are off mains gas uh, have uh, difficulties of their own. It would be extremely helpful, of course, if the UK government lived up to what it said it was going to do in terms of fuel prices and put a cap in them. And maybe Mr Chapman uh, can actually talk to his colleagues at Westminster to see if they will do that, because that would be of great relief to those that are living in remote, rural and island communities. Question seven has been withdrawn. Question number eight, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government in light of recent issues regarding TSB's online banking service and further branch closures, including by Santander, whether it will carry out an assessment of their impact on businesses and people who find it difficult to access or use online or telephone banking. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the recent IT problems at TSB have highlighted the continued importance of physical access to banking services. While regulation of banks and financial services remains reserved, the Scottish Government has made its position clear. Uh, consumers across Scotland need to be able to access essential banking services in the way that best meets their needs. While online banking offers advantages for many customers, it is not suitable for all customers. The Financial Conduct Authority, with responsibility for regulation of the financial services sector, will investigate TSB's systems failure and monitor the bank's resolution of the problems faced by its customers. Highlands and Isles Enterprise has commissioned work to investigate the impact of branch closures on communities and businesses in the Highlands and Islands area, and the Scottish Government will review the findings of that work and the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee's ongoing inquiry into banking services and consider appropriate action to support communities. Christine Graham. I thank the Minister for his answer and encourage that the government might consider an assessment. The, member will, the Minister will be aware that the Royal Bank of Scotland and Melrose has a temporary reprieve but only till December and I'm only too aware as he is as it's part of his constituency of the many constituents and small businesses for which Melrose is renowned that they need an on-street not online bank. Considering we own 72.9% of Royal Bank of Scotland and this is, do not consider this is a rotten deal for the public. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, in benefits of time, uh, presiding officer, I'll say I, I very much agree with uh, Christine Graham on that this is a, uh, certainly a bad outcome for uh, customers of the banks. Uh, we are working with the banks, though, and I'm encouraged the banks are increasingly in discussions with us, recognising the importance of having some retention of face-to-face -face services where that's possible to, to do so. Uh, and I want to uh, reassure the member that we're very much focusing on the needs not just of the south of Scotland and Melrose in uh, Ms Graham's constituency, but also the whole of Scotland. Quick supplementary, James Kelly. Very quick, please. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just reinforce the, the, the point that uh, banks are the centrepiece of local communities, and we've seen the detrimental effect that this has had in closures in Cambus Lang and Rutherglen, and I would urge the Minister to do everything in his power to avert these closures. 
An even quicker response, please, Paul Wheelhouse. I will certainly do everything I can to try and mitigate the impact of these closures, and indeed, if we can, do prevent them. That was even quicker than I expected. <laughs> and that concludes general questions. And we, the next item of business is First Minister's questions.